Our next speaker, Mark, um, actually flew down with me and he's a specialist in aviation human factors. He finished his master's in that last year. He's also a midwife and a registered nurse, a bit of a nomad. He's been to Scotland with his work, comes from central Queensland. He said, don't hold that against him. Um, and he's done that sort of nomadic life of nursing and midwifery across Australia. Um, he's specialising at the moment in mums and bubs in rural settings, especially remote settings, and that's what he's here to talk to you about today. So if we can give a very warm welcome to Mark Holmes, please. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for having me. So um, what an inspiring story. Jamie just reminded me exactly why we're here and what we do. Um, as Jackie said, um, I am from Queensland and I am here to help, as Kevin07 um, promptly said. But um, Jamie might be interested to know that Dave Appleton um, and Brady Fielder are the rodeo champions from my hometown, so he probably will be able to place me um, exactly where I am. Um, but before we start, I would like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri um, people and the land that we are on today. Sovereignty was never ceded. And I'd also like to acknowledge those women that have birthed on their lands, but more importantly, probably those women that have been denied the opportunity to birth on those lands. As most of you from that Northwest will know, there's a distinct lack of birthing services out there, which is where you wonderful people come in to fill that gap in our community. So I am from Queensland, as I did say, um, oh, we've got some Queensland. Yes! <laughs> Excellent. Last time the State of Origin was on, I was here in Dubbo, and it was a very dangerous time to be a, <laughs> to be a, a Queenslander. But why I'm talking about Queensland is that's where my midwifery journey actually began, in um, Cairns in far north Queensland. And it was the first day that I was actually a registered midwife, so my very first shift as a registered midwife. And I rocked up and was lucky to work with this a beautiful family who were having their first baby. And the defining thing for me was there's a bottle of um, Moet, and it is Moet and Chandon. Mr. Mr. Moet was a Dutch um, person, the umlaut. So it's not Moe, it's Moet. So if you learn nothing else today, you can go back and say the city, oh no, I can't use that word because I'm being recorded, has come and told you how to um, say Moet. But I plainly remember this bottle of Moet, and we were talking with the mum in labour, and they were having this bottle of champagne, and it's just sitting there in the corner of the birthing unit, just looking at me. Beautiful labour, everything's going upright, moving in cans, you look out to the sea, and we're doing all this um, beautiful stuff. But then there was a little trickle of blood, um, vaginally, and I thought, that's a little bit abnormal, is this intrapartum hemorrhage? called my um, obstetric consultant, they came in, we did some monitoring, nothing was wrong, progressed on to have a baby, but the baby, when he was born, just refused to breathe. And I was absolutely shocked, because there was nothing that told me about the fact that this baby was unwell. Uh, so we attempted resuscitation of this baby, and we got him breathing, and he got tubed, and he went and spent a lot of time in the special care nursery. Uh, he eventually died because he had had a brain hemorrhage sometime through his, uh, in his gestation period. Um, sorry, I forgot to say, I might, I'm going to talk about maternal cases, so if, I, if there's any pregnant um, women here or if there's anyone that gets upset, please feel free to go out and I will be here to chat later because I am going to talk about some good things and some bad things. Um, but back to the special care nursery in Cairns and this little baby died and they withdrew care and I beat myself up. I still beat myself up about that. I went through an RCA, as we all do eventually, and the RCA process is extremely flawed, but that's a different story. Um, and I spent a lot of time with that family. I cried with them and I just beat myself up over and over and over again. And I had a beautiful midwifery mentor from Ireland um, as Irish midwives, are there, is there any Irish midwives in the crowd? Because thank you, you are amazing. Um, and she said to me, Mark, your care was exemplary. When we went through, and we went through the coroners, we went through the RCA, we went through the external investigations, your care was exemplary. And I'm like, yeah, but this baby died. 
how can how can I have exemplary care? So that's nearly um, that little baby would probably be about 16 today had he survived, and that weighs on my mind heavily. But I started thinking about that midwife, and she said, "You know what? Maybe sometimes we can learn from things that go right, and even though it was a bad outcome, we can learn some things that go right." So that led me on a really long journey to this thing called safety one and safety two. So without boring you to death with the human factors aspect of it, safety one is what we practice here, where it's reactive, there's RCAs, we think about everything that goes wrong, we focus on everything that goes wrong, missing the fact that nearly 99% of the time, things actually go right. But we never learn from those things. And the real, the real learning actually comes from... Look at that, isn't that fabulous service? That's what Club Dub's known for. Um, so, here we, um, we... Things that often go more... Things that are, that are difficult, as in the birthing camps, but it technically went right. It, it, everything was done. It taught me some great lessons. Um, and then there's the um, early completion and innovation. This is where the magic happens, and this is where we have learning from excellence. So... I am very lucky to work with an amazing team of nurses, midwives, paramedics, engineers, pilots in Sydney. And this is some of my team, and they all say hello to you, um, and I'm sure you're very familiar with them. So I've shared one of my stories, and I've spoken to my colleagues because I can't stand here for 35 minutes and talk about myself. So I'm going to share some stories from my colleagues, uh, and it all focuses on northwest New South Wales. Who's from Walgett? Raise your hand. Because you're, you're going to feature heavily in this, I'm sorry, um, as we know. So, first case is, quite, is, is relatively old, and this is um, a flight nurse midwife called um, Nicola, Nicole. And um, she was on a priority one flight nurse only flight um, of a night, night shift. Mammals like to birth at um, night. Most primates give birth around 3 to 5 a.m., so being a mammally primate thing, us humans like to do birthing at those times as well. So she's going out to pick up a post VF arrest on um, Tyra Fiban, so that will, t that will tell you how um, old it is, um, and GTN and um, external pacing and the usual run-of-the-mill stuff that we do. Um, but mid-flight, she gets a phone call from our operations centre in Sydney, uh, and it was Walgett um, on the phone, and they had needed some urgent assistance. So for those that have been to, have flown into Walgett um, at night, this is what Walgett at night looks like. Um, it is a very, very dark, um, dark place. And there's not a lot of light out there. With no moon and no clouds, it is a really, really dark place. So let's go to Walgett Multipurpose Health Service. And a 27-year-old uh, woman at 38 weeks pregnant, so at term, has walked into the clinic contracting 3 in 10, which is pretty well-established labour, and she felt a gush of blood and that there was something in her knickers, something unusual in her knickers. So what do we think is possibly happening? Oh, I heard bursting and I heard cord prolapse. So um, the enrolled, endorsed enrolled nurse, are there any EENs or ENs in the crowd? Oh, no. You're supposed to stand up and have it, because EENs run these places. So they are the um, amazing unsung um, nursing heroes of multi-purpose health services and small health services. They know their stuff. Anyway, the EN um, recognised this and did the appropriate clinical intervention and um, inserted her fingers and pushed the presenting part off the cord to prevent the cord being um, squashed and um, causing hypoxia to the baby. So the only thing is, is once you do that, you're committed to that. If that happens in a tertiary facility, we will then get under the blanket with the woman and be pushed quickly down to um, theatre. So the only problem is, is the closest theatre to Walgett is in Dubbo. And they're not that close. So um, we have to get, we have to get um, her the treatment. So um, we did some interventions. You fill the bladder to try and keep the um, presenting part off that cord and bounce it up and um, gave her some nifedipine. Um, Nick, 
Nicole said we would just kept feeding her nifedipine, nifedipine, and gave her fluids to deal with the blood pressure. That's to stop the labour. Um, but then we're committed to transferring this woman in this position all the way to Dubbo, which they did. They took the enrolled nurse to do that. They swapped with the flight nurse midwife who um, had her fingers on the presenting part. And they got on the plane in, the, um, in this, lovely, this lovely position here the, um, and transferred her, uh, secured her, um, because we're also, uh, also cabin attendants and have civil aviation regulations that we have to look um, after. And unlike on the road, we technically can't break those laws. So, Casta, if you're watching me, I didn't say that. Um, but she was restrained as best as she could. And this is what rural and remote people do all the time. You know, the fancy word is resilience. I just call it thinking outside the box. And this is, this is what we do for our communities. Good news is, is we got this lady to, um, to Dubbo, uh, escorted into theatre, and they did an emergency caesarean. And the baby had upgars of seven out of 10 is the best. Uh, seven at one minute, and then nine after a little bit of um, IPPV uh, and had apgars of nine. And I was lucky enough last night to find out that uh, he is doing extremely well in the community um, today. So that's learning from excellence. That is a massive team uh, response and really proud to be part of that team. It takes roughly, if we, if we um, slim it down, it takes roughly 16 people to move one patient in an aeromedical transfer. Uh, and it, in reality, it takes a lot more. It's 16 positions. Um, so there you go, we flew out some happy snaps and we got her to Dubbo and uh, things were very, very well. This is Victoria, she's um, one of our uh, other flight nurse midwives and this time she's going to northwestern New South Wales. Uh, another night shift, back of the night shift, 3am call, remember the mammals are birthing at this time. Uh, and this is a 21 year old uh, woman has presented at 24 weeks pregnant uh, to a multi-purpose health service out in the northwest that has no obstetric nor midwifery support. So Victoria takes the phone call, gets a bit of a story, and it's, it suddenly becomes, that's the clinical details, had some steroids. There was a trickle of blood, so they were thinking that it was an antepartum hemorrhage, and we don't give nifedipine in this case. So she was having um, all of that treatment. But her distance, and I'm sure you're all well aware of the tyranny of distance, um, and all these rules, if you're 250 kilometres under, if you're 150 kilometres, if you're 400 kilometres. So she was in this really grey, this grey zone. So... She could go by road, and that was about a 150 kilometre um, transfer by road. And there were some very nervous paramedics that didn't particularly want to do that at night, and I um, completely understand that. The option was to go with um, fixed wing, uh, and, but there's obviously a delay. It's, uh, it's at least a one and a half hour flight to this destination, plus the 30 minute activation time. So we're looking at a two hour um, journey and this is what we face in aeromedical all the time. They could drive and be at the destination by the time we're landing. So it's making that risk-based assessment which is always very, very difficult. Do we go to Dubbo? Is Dubbo the right place for a 24-weeker? Probably not but it's better than um, in the far northwest. Or do we go on to Sydney or Newcastle where there is more definitive care? So um, they jumped in the plane, decided to go fix wing um, because I'm talking about it. Um, they didn't look like this on the way out. I can, I can, <laughs> I can tell you they did not. They did not look like this. So big shout out to our female pilot Jackie. So she, uh, female pilots make up five percent of the world's uh, workforce, uh, and there's a goal to have uh, twenty percent by 2026. So if you know any girls in your community that want to be pilots, uh, now's your time to. Um, join the profession. She sadly left us and now flies for uh, an airline and is probably going to run it in two days. Um, and so they didn't look like that, but we have to be, we have to be happy. Um, but they went out there and Victoria walked in and found a woman on all fours on the bed in this little emergency department, grunting and groaning with some anal pouting. And Victoria went, I would much rather not be here right now. And she's the midwife. Um, so um, the woman progressed very quickly to have um, bulging membranes. Those membranes ruptured very quickly and a little person, some bit, came out. 
The clue then was that that baby had meconium, like a big tarry thing coming out, and Victoria soon realised that this was going to be a breech birth. So, long story short is that it was a relatively difficult breech birth. With preterm breech births, a little bottom can slip out of not fully dilated cervix, um, and the bottom is a little bit smaller than the head in a um, breech birth, so that baby um, had, had required some extra manoeuvres and um, some advanced um, midwifery and obstetric uh, manoeuvres. Uh, they successfully brought, um, birthed a live female infant uh, that weighed 625 grams. So that's a really tiny little person. Um, the local team, once again, EEN, shout out to them, uh, and local doctors, nurses, and the paramedics with the SERS assist, so shout out to those guys, um, resuscitated and had a prolonged resuscitation of this, of this baby. We all knew that it was futile. It, it, at this stage, being um, out, outborn at 24 weeks, being inborn in a tertiary facility, you have relatively low but good survival, but being outborn at 24 weeks. So this is where we get into that really difficult conversation um, and care, and no one on the ground wants to make that decision. So we discussed, uh, Victoria discussed with NETS, uh, neonatologists and everything, and then she's had to have one of the most difficult conversations of her, of her career to say to that family that your little girl um, is, not going to, is not going to make it. We cannot possibly do anything more. And that's heart-wrenching. We've, like, we've all had to do it, um, but that is absolutely heart-wrenching. But we swaddled the baby, we gave it to mum and dad, um, did some photos, and uh, Victoria, this, so she let, this is about 6 a.m., um, and this is uh, at the end of her night shift, uh, and Victoria stayed there for the next couple of hours until that baby eventually died in the arms of its parents. Uh, and that's the sad reality of this, this situation. And like myself, uh, Victoria came back and beat herself up about this clinical care. And yes, we had an outcome, but this is an exceptional um, example of learning from excellence because every one of those clinicians, from our control centre midwives to our paramedics, to our doctors, nurses, EENs, everyone worked together, um, consultants, medical consultants, neonatologists. Um, Jamie talked about having 17 doctors standing around. Well, this little girl who unfortunately died had, had a massive team behind her. And we can take some lessons from that because that actually, that's actually working. That's what we're here to do. That's, that is excellence in care. For these, for these people, right down to having that open disclosure conversation and delivering bad, and delivering bad news, which is part of our um, role. But it's not all doom and gloom. Um, and this is uh, Matt, who is a paramedic who's jumped the fence and um, become a flight nurse midwife. Um, and he, uh, daytime, for some reason, um, this woman, is, didn't decide to be a mammal, but um, is a daytime, and this is, this is Walgut from there. It is an old photo. I have been around for about 11 years now, um, but it is an old photo. So, yes, there, are, um, there is light out there, and it's a beautiful town, the fish traps. No, that's Brewarrina, wrong place. Anyway, go to Walgut. Um, we, and uh, this lovely lady is Alinta, and Alinta has given um, New South Wales Ambulance Media permission to share her story and her name. Um, so she is a first-time mum, and she has come into the, con come into the uh, clinic contracting 3 in 10, um, pretty, pretty good labour. But Matt, Matt flies out there, no, not much concern, because once again, these women ha are denied the right to birth on their local um, lands. There's no facilities out there. They have to travel into, into Dubbo, and at, at 36 weeks, they sp they're supposed to come into um, Dubbo. But she's out there at term, and Matt goes out and she's in labour, but she's not in cracking labour, or so he thought. And you've heard enough of me telling stories, and who better to tell this story of Alinta than our friends at Sunrise? 
Uh, now to a very special delivery, thanks to one of Australia's flying midwives. You might not know it, but in the skies over regional New South Wales, there are specialist nurses who fly in and fly out. They're there to assist expectant mums in remote towns who can't get to a properly equipped hospital. For the most part, it goes pretty smoothly. But on this occasion, one little boy arrived in spectacular fashion. Looking at this angelic face, you would never guess how this baby made a dramatic entry into the world. Matt Thompson is a mid-air midwife. He travels New South Wales in an air ambulance delivering babies for women in remote towns. Air ambulance is working from the city to the bush, delivering excellence and care from the air. Going to Dubbo by road is four hours, so it's really important that Air Ambulance is able to facilitate a service and transport ladies that are in need, because some ladies can't wait four hours. First time Mama Linta had gone into labour and needed to be rushed to Dubbo Hospital for the delivery. It was a short 45 minute flight from her hometown of Walgett, but that was simply too long for Linta to hang on. She needed to push and midwife Matt had to perform his first airplane delivery. Then, just like that, Alexander Ian Dudley Dennis was born in the sky. Well, at 15,000 feet, like, I was ecstatic. Um, putting Bub on Mum's chest was really delightful to see. It was really a joyous moment. And, and Dad was beside himself. He loved it. They landed at Dubbo Airport with an extra passenger, proudly presenting the little bundle of joy. Thanks to Matt, a healthy Mum and Bub get to return home with their reunion on the cards. Oh God, hello. Hello. How, How are, are you? you? I'm good, I'm thanks. How are you, man? Yeah, I'm good. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm throwing myself around a little bit. Happy it's to see you. Must be exciting. <laughs> Would you um, like a hug? Oh, I'd love mm. one. Thank you. You're welcome. It's definitely got dads here. Yeah, hey? definitely. What makes it so special is Alex is one of two babies born in the air in the last 10 years with wow. New South Wales Air Ambulance. So, oh, yeah. that's special. You're famous already, buddy. <laughs> For Mum, the whole experience is surreal. Matt was a bit concerned, so was I. Yeah, and so got on the air ambulance and 15 minutes later gave birth in the air. It was great. He was awesome. He was the best. I had no dramas at all. Like I was pretty scared because it was the first time I've ever been on a plane. I still can't believe that it's happened. Like Becoming a mum and going up in the air and pushing out a little bub. A humble Matt has become somewhat of a hero around Walgett with Grandma heaping praise on the man who brought her grandson into the world. I just want to say thank you very much for delivering my green baby so safe and sound and looking after my family up in the air. We need more people like you. Baby Alex is already the apple of his mum's eye. The best baby ever. I'm very lucky for a first time mum. And isn't he a cute little baby? So um, that's as, as Matt, so first thing, babies aren't delivered, pizzas are delivered, babies are born and birthed, um, so Channel 7, take note. Um, and, and secondly, they mentioned that we've had a little bit of a baby boom in the air. We've tried really hard for many years to try and stay and um, play and birth uh, women on the ground, but we've actually had now three births um, in the air despite everything that we can. And that's because of the closure of a facility out there that would... Um, that is a little bit closer than Dubbo. Uh, so it is the closure of these facilities really um, do impact on us. So thank you to my team at Mascot, particularly uh, Nikki, Victoria and Matt for allowing me to share their stories uh, on their behalf. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you.